Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I, hope I hope you can all hear me. Anyway, um, I wanted to... Uh, this book has actually come out today, so it's a sort of auspicious day for me. Um, so I wanted to point out we all die, but we don't die at the same rate. So if you have, for example, a mayfly, if you're a mayfly, you, you only live about a day. If you're a butterfly, you can live for a week or uh, some cases months. Uh, then at the other end, you have the Galapagos tortoise, 150 years. Uh, there's probably a tortoise around that uh, probably saw Darwin. And uh, there's the bowhead whale uh, over 200 years and a Greenland shark over 400 years. And this might give you the idea that death is programmed, that different species are programmed to diet, uh, you know, at different rates and, uh, and so on. Uh, but that turns out uh, not to be true. If you look at lifespan, and this just shows mostly mammals, the, the dots are all mammals, there's a correlation between lifespan and size. So the larger you are, on average, the longer you can expect to live. And this is because evolution doesn't care about how long you live. Evolution optimizes for fitness. It wants to make sure that your genes have the maximum likelihood of being passed on. And so if you're small, there's no point in spending a lot of resources to maintain and repair the body to keep it alive for longer because you're going to be eaten or starved to death long before that. And so uh, if you're larger, though, it is an advantage. You, you have more time to find a mate and you have more time to produce offspring. So that's the general rule. And the rule is even uh, stricter if you look at metabolism, so small animals have a much higher metabolic rate, so they have to use many more resources to maintain themselves, and uh, you know, they don't live as long. Now, there are outliers. For example, on the left up there, you can see Brant's bat. Uh, lives many times what you would expect for its size. Uh, similarly, a favorite of the aging community is the naked mole rat, an ugly uh, underground creature. Uh, also lives many times its life. And then, uh, at the other end, you have uh, those large animals. The Galapagos tortoise is an outlier. And generally, animals that can fly and thereby escape predators and forage over a wi wider area for food live much longer than terrestrial animals of the same uh, size. And notice that humans there are actually an outlier. So we have this lifespan which is determined by evolution for optimizing fitness. Uh, the question is, can we exceed that lifespan. So here are two animals that seem to not age biologically. Uh, one is a freshwater animal called hydra, another so-called immortal jellyfish. These animals have the capability of regenerating their tissue. Uh, they can just constantly replenish their tissue uh, with stem cells. In fact, the jellyfish can even go backwards in development. It would be as if a butterfly turned back into a caterpillar. Now, that suggests that aging is not inevitable, that you might be able to uh, circumvent uh, natural limits. Now, what's our natural limit? Well, this is Jean Calmont, who uh, would every day have a, a cigarette and a glass of port, uh, and she holds a record at 122 years, okay? And, uh, apart from the cigarette and port, she also consumed two and a half pounds of chocolate uh, a week. Now, nobody else since she died uh, in 1997 has lived past 120. And so this suggests that maybe uh, there's a natural limit to our lifespan. Uh, another indication of that is that the number of centenarians is growing because of improvements in healthcare. More people are surviving into their 80s and 90s, and mo so more people are making it to 100. But the number of super centenarians, 110 plus, is actually not growing, suggesting that maybe there is a natural limit uh, that these people are reaching. So, however, that is our natural biological limit determined by evolution, but it doesn't mean that if we alter our biology uh, by understanding the reasons for why we age, that we might not be able to breach that limit uh, someday. So 
the other thing I want to point out is the breakthroughs in aging have come out from the most uh, unusual cases. So, for example, one of the uh, more, more promising compounds uh, that's used in the, you know, for anti-aging research is rapamycin. Now, rapamycin was discovered when a bunch of microbiologists in Canada uh, went to Easter Island. They were wondering why the natives of Easter Island uh, didn't get tetanus, even though they walked barefoot. So they thought there must be antibiotics in these soil bacteria. They cultivated them, and one of them, uh, which was named rapamycin after Rapa Nui, which is uh, the name for Easter Island, um, so it turned out to be antifungal. Now, that was, mild, that was sort of interesting, uh, but then it also turned out to be a potent anti-tumor, uh, had potent anti-tumor activity. And so people started pursuing it, then they found out it was also an uh, anti-inflammatory uh, immunosuppressor. And uh, this guy, Suren Segal, at Ayers Lab, was very keen on rapamycin, but Ayers merged with Wyeth, so he had to move to uh, the United States. By then, a lot of people had simply stopped uh, being interested in rapamycin, but the reason that we still study it today is this guy was so persistent. He grew a huge batch of the bacteria that make rapamycin, packed it in a freezer in his uh, house in an ice cream carton, and uh, labeled it don't eat, and then simply took it with him to New Jersey and then persuaded his new bosses to continue to work on it. And that's one reason why rapamycin has actually survived, and then it now is uh, big in longevity studies. Now here's another weird thing. This is Papua New Guinea, just uh, north of Australia, as you know. And in the highlands of New Guinea, uh, there's a tribe uh, called the Four Tribe. Now these people suffered from a disease called Kuru, uh, which uh, caused, you know, among things, it caused uh, outbreaks of uh, maniacal laughter and uh, then followed by dementia and death. And people wanted to understand why they had this disease. And so Carlton Geideschek, who was in Melbourne at the time, he's an American, uh, was sent to Papua New Guinea and then he worked among these tribes people and he found out that uh, the reason that they got Kuru was because they, were, uh, they, they had a practice of cannibalism. So when their uh, relatives died, they would uh, eat the uh, remains of, of those relatives, including the brains. And then he found out that it's probably that eating the brain contained some element that caused Kuru. Now that's the basis of later discoveries, including the discovery of prions by Stanley Prusner, who worked on scrapies. And then eventually, uh, we now today know that many uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's uh, result from uh, proteins misfolding and, uh, and aggregating. And uh, you know, Alzheimer's uh, is very likely a, a prion-like disease, except we don't go around eating brains of uh, Alzheimer patients. So, uh, that's how unusual uh, the path is from today's work on dementia to uh, where it started. Now, Geideschek is also interesting because he has, a, he has this unusual or rather unfortunate distinction of being a Nobel laureate and a convicted child molester. Now, there's a huge explosion in longevity research with both real advances and a lot of dubious claims. And this is because we're all concerned about aging and death, so it's a field that's uh, uh, you know, got a lot of very good research, but also an enormous amount of hype. And one reason for the explosion in, in the research is uh, the, the growing aging population. So if you look at 1966, most of the population was young. There were very few people over 60. Uh, and you can see the population, the, the fraction of population over 60 has been growing steadily. And so we need to figure out, uh, as societies age, how to keep older people healthy and productive and independent uh, for a longer uh, period of time. And that, in turn, requires understanding uh, the causes of aging. And once we understand the underlying biological processes, uh, we can do things 
uh, to alleviate uh, some of the symptoms of aging and, and possibly uh, even live longer. And this, of course, has led to an explosion of research. It's not just published in uh, sort of the mainstream biological journals, but there's been a huge proliferation of journals that specialize in aging research. And uh, accompanying all of this research is also an enormous amount of investment. So there are about 700 startups with many tens of billions of dollars uh, invested uh, in the uh, last decade or so. Now, along with that, there are also uh, some interesting things. There's also gr an, an explosion in recommendation of uh, nutritional supplements, what I call nutraceuticals. This is a slide from Tom Check. Uh, you know, extending telomeres is, first of all, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a complicated fact, but you could extend your telomeres on Amazon.com, at least, by, uh, you know, uh, buying one of these uh, supplements. Uh, of course, none of these uh, uh, supplements require FDA approval. They're not drugs. Uh, they're you know, natural compounds. And uh, of course, uh, th many of them have no clinical trials. I'm not saying this is true of uh, all supplements. But there are also, along with that, a lot of very promising approaches. So uh, one of them is caloric restriction, which uh, has been sh shown for uh, you know, almost a century uh, to have beneficial effects on aging. And there are drugs that mimic caloric restriction, and rapamycin, which I mentioned, is one of them, and uh, it seems to be uh, promising. But remember, rapamycin is an immunosuppressant. Uh, it could also make you prone to infection. It can slow down wound healing. So you need to find that sweet spot between not having the side effects and having uh, beneficial effects. And Another uh, interesting thing is that people found, I think about 50 years ago, that if you, if you connected two animals and uh, had them share their blood uh, circulatory system, the younger animal would supply young blood to the older animal, and the older animal would then, uh, you know, it would be beneficial. It would alleviate many of the symptoms of aging. Now, this is, of course, a, an active area of research. But there are p companies that jumped the gun and started offering uh, young plasma to billionaires who uh, wanted to sort of get regular infusion. This is a picture of Brian Johnson, who, in an effort to keep it all in the family, uh, uh, you know, rope, roped in his son and his father and sort of exchanged blood by going sort of young to older to oldest. Uh, and uh, I think he recently stopped because he said he wasn't seeing any benefits, but he thought the principal uh, was still true, and that is true. That the principle probably is true, and there are a lot of scientists looking for factors in young blood that um, uh, you know alleviate uh, symptoms of aging, possibly by repair mechanisms, possibly by regenerating stem cells, etc. And that's a, a, an active area of research. Uh, another big area is that as we age, we send cells into senescence. Uh, now, a senescent cell is a cell that um, doesn't divide, but it also secretes inflammatory compounds. And normally, these cells are made at the site of stress or damage, and these inflammatory compounds have a purpose. They're signaling repair cells to come in and repair that uh, particular uh, part, and also to clear away the senescent cell. But as we get older, uh, these, these other mechanisms don't work as well, and we accumulate senescent cells, and that causes a, a, a higher, uh, in, an increase in inflammation. And so targeting senescent cells for destruction is another uh, promising approach to uh, alleviating uh, some of the symptoms of aging. And finally, I want to talk about stem cells. So, you know, we all know fertilized egg develops into an embryo and, uh, and, and eventually into a child. And uh, this has to do with the fact that although we start from a single cell, those cells differentiate. And as they differentiate, the stem cells, which initially could make any type of tissue, differentiate into different types of stem cells, and then finally generate different types of tissues. And the question is, can you go backwards? And there are factors, Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize, just showed how you could uh, take a, an adult cell and go have it go backwards in development, in fact, all the way back to pluripotent cells, which can differentiate into any, any other kind of tissue. And of course, this is also 
fraught because there are risks of tumors, teratomas, possibly other cancers. Some of those factors are oncogenic. So it is, again, uh, one of those things which is very exciting and very promising, but again needs to be looked at uh, very carefully. Now, while we're waiting for all these uh, things to happen, there are things we can do. And this is the sort of trinity uh, for health, which is something possibly our grandparents have told us, which is to eat moderately and eat healthy uh, diets, to get enough sleep, and to get exercise. And it turns out that each of those affects the other two. So it's really a kind of virtuous uh, cycle. If you, if you get started on one, you're more likely to do the other two. Currently, this trinity, if you do all of them at once, works better than any medicine on the market. It has no side effects, and it's free. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, I uh, take, you know, I uh, do all of these things, but nevertheless, I developed high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and I have to take drugs eventually. You know, I had to take blood pressure medicines and statins. So the goal of the aging community is to slightly uh, see if we can go beyond what we can do uh, with natural interventions. And as I say, uh, we're on the threshold with very, very powerful tools uh, in biology, which is both increasing our understanding of aging, but also the ability uh, to do something about it. Thank you very much.